Hello from Beijing. I believe I'm patient zero of a future zombie outbreak. Hello, my English name is Amanda Liu, and I'm a master's student at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. As you may agree, China is flawed from a political standpoint. Most of the people in my generation know this. To be fair, I have friends in the Western world who feel the same way about their own leaders. As we have seen recently, viruses have no borders, and it is incredibly important that the world is aware of my condition. I resent having to use a VPN just to post on this. Government censors are preventing me from telling my story through any form of Chinese media. I write to you now in what is a rare state of lucidness. Before my death, I would like to make my story known. The source of my illness did not come from food or animal origin. Some strange food is consumed here, but the strangest of these foods, like bats and pangolins, are only consumed by a very small percentage of the population. You could compare it to the number of Americans who eat possum or armadillo. I personally like Subway and Pizzot, which is very popular here. As part of my master's project, I traveled to a remote part of Yunnan province in order to document one of the world's rarest known mushrooms. It is known here only by its traditional name, which roughly translates to black brain fungus. The mycelium, which act like the roots of mushrooms, has only been found growing in underground caves deeper than 200 meters. No one has ever documented the fruiting of this mushroom, which is what happens when the mycelium produces its reproductive organs above ground. So you can imagine my joyous surprise when 300 meters underground, in total darkness pierced only by my head torch, I stumbled upon the potentially first ever discovered fruiting specimen. The mushroom had a grayish brain-like texture on the cap. This brain was punctuated by a number of pores that oozed a tar-like liquid. One might be disturbed by its appearance, but to me it was beautiful. The smell, however, was that of rancid flesh, making me gag as I approached it. I took many photos, over 100 actually, wanting to capture it from all angles. I then attempted to take a spore print. To do this, I have to cut off the cap of the mushroom, which I feel bad about doing, but it is essential to the further research of this species. As I begin to cut the stem, the cap suddenly inflates, like a puffer fish, the black tar squirting onto my gloves and shirt. And then, just as suddenly it deflates, leaving me choking on a cloud of dust-like spores. Despite a ruined shirt and a lungful of spores, I bag the cap of the mushroom and begin my ascent above ground, followed by a very long train journey home to Beijing. The symptoms came the next day, flu-like, headache, and loss of appetite. I also got my period two weeks early. I thought it could be coronavirus, but I had taken mandatory tests when re-entering Beijing. Having tested negative, I could continue to work in the lab at my university. I took my spore prints and thoroughly documented my specimen using the standard methods. On the third day of my return, my boyfriend Tao really started to worry about me. I was not eating, I had no appetite but my stomach was constantly rumbling. He made me stay home in our apartment and kept trying to feed me my favorite foods. He is really kind, but whenever I tried to eat something it tasted so bad, I felt like puking. On day four of not eating, Tao took me to the hospital. They ran all types of tests on me and asked many exhausting questions. All I wanted to do was sleep. I felt very weak. They put me on an IV and kept me overnight. Tao stayed with me. I don't remember anything, but he told me as best he could what happened. In the middle of the night, I suddenly stood up from my bed, awakening Tao, who was asleep on a folding bed beside me. My eyes were open, but I was unresponsive like a sleepwalker. I slowly started to walk out of my room and down the corridor, my mouth slightly agape. Despite the late hour, there was still some activity in the emergency wing. Someone was being amputated in a nearby operating room. I was apparently captivated by this, and when a nurse packaged an amputated leg for disposal, I followed. She brought it to a transfer facility to be made safe a room where they prepare hazardous waste to be transferred and incinerated. Tao tried fruitlessly to wake me and hold me back, but as the nurse left I slipped into the empty transfer room 
and tore through the thick plastic waste bag with my nails. Tao described me as having inhuman strength, and nothing he tried would stop me. When I brushed him away, he was knocked down with incredible force. I consumed the entire leg, ripping the flesh from the bone like a rabid dog. The bones then crunching like cereal in my jaw. Thinking back on this, I am so ashamed. How could my body and subconscious commit such a savage act? Tao did not state this, but I knew his opinion of me was gravely tarnished. I'm however so thankful for him as he stayed by my side and did not give up on me. He cleaned the blood from my face and hands that night. He found me new clothes and managed to get me back into my bed without alerting any of the staff to what I had done. I asked him why, and he said, I didn't want them to take you away. When I awoke the next day, I felt re-energized and was actually smiling. I was released despite Tao's insistence that they do more tests, but the doctors needed the beds for COVID patients and could find nothing wrong with me. When we got home, that's when Tao told me of my midnight episode. I did not believe him, but he showed me the blood under my nails, and I broke down crying and afraid. I tried to throw up in the toilet, but nothing came up. Tao was worried that if it happened again, he couldn't control me. I was too strong. We agreed that he would tie me to the bed tonight just in case. I had been tied to our bed before actually, and not against my will. Despite the bondage, my boyfriend was not attracted to me that night, and I cannot blame him. He was very quiet and kept his distance. I was worried that he would never see me the same way again. I wanted to prove to him I was a normal person, but I had trouble believing it myself. What was happening to me? Tao spent the day on his PC playing his favorite game, Sword and Fairy, a replica of a sword from the game on the wall above him. I'm glad that he's playing it now, keeping busy. I used to hate to see him play it so much when I was in need of attention, and I admit, I sometimes fantasized that the sword above him would fall on his neck. When I fell asleep, I had nightmares of being trapped in the cave, the rancid brain like mushrooms surrounding me, unleashing their spore clouds. Tao was not in bed when I woke up. I was still tied. When he saw that I was awake, he came over to untie me. Did I do it again? I asked. The look in his eye said it all. I looked at my legs and wrists. They were scratched from where I struggled against my restraints. As Tao leaned over me to free my arm, I saw the mark on his ear. What happened to your ear, Tao? He did not answer at first. Tao, in the night, you bit me. I was devastated and afraid, even though I did not know at the time what this would lead to. I didn't know if I was more scared of what was happening to me or more afraid of losing Tao. I'm sure he saw me for what I now was, a monster. To take my mind off things, I returned to the lab to continue my studies. It was the weekend and I was there alone. I was studying the spore print under the microscope. I isolated a single spore on a slide, and what I saw was unlike any spore I'd seen before. It resembled a virus rather than a spore, but on a much larger scale, on top of that it was moving. I had to prepare three more samples to be sure. While examining the third slide I coughed and to my shock, a dozen more spores appeared on the slide. I took a clean slide, spat on it and confirmed that my saliva was full of spores. Panic set in, when I'm anxious I clean, it somehow makes me feel better. I thoroughly cleaned all the equipment with the strongest disinfectants in the lab. I packaged the mushroom cap and spore print in a dozen layers of specimen bags and labeled it as extremely hazardous before storing it in the ULT freezer. In the hall of my apartment building, I ran into my neighbor's child. When her parents are fighting, which is often, she plays with her dolls in the hall outside our door. When she saw me, she fled back inside her apartment and locked the door. As I entered my own apartment, I looked in the mirror. I had dark circles under my eyes, which themselves were dilated and bloodshot. My skin pale and my lips were a grayish purple. The feeling of not liking my own reflection is familiar to me. The feeling of being frightened by my own reflection was heartbreaking. Just by looking at Tao, I knew he was infected too. He started experiencing symptoms the next day. 
They were the same as mine, but at an accelerated pace, he did not get his period. At this point, I attempted to notify the media, to warn people of our sickness. No one I spoke to took us seriously, and all the posts I made online disappeared within hours. It was like screaming my warning into a void. I called my parents who lived in Shandong. I did not give them the full story, but they were still concerned and volunteered to come look after me. I told them that I would get over it soon. I did not want to subject them to the illness, and entering Shanghai is difficult under the current restrictions. Tao and I took turns sleeping that night, each of us watching over the other. Tao reported increased thrashing in my sleep. I even broke one of the restraints. My hunger was returning. During my turn watching over him, I was constantly chewing my own nails until there was almost nothing left. If this was nerves or hunger, I do not know. The next day we stayed in, I knew the mushroom was the source of our sickness, but Tao spent all his time online, researching our symptoms. When he stood up, I thought he had found something, but he was unresponsive. He must have fallen asleep at his desk. He stood there for a long time, not moving, back turned to me. There was a voice in the hall outside. His attention snapped towards the door and he grabbed the handle, fumbling with the lock. I tried to stop him, but he brushed me aside and pulled the door open. The young girl was out there again. I could see her through his legs, sitting on the floor with her toys spread out around her in a circle. Toe grabbed her by the leg, lifting her with ease towards his drooling mouth. The girl screamed. I jumped on Tao's back, my arms around his neck. He thrashed around to throw me off. His jaw snapped mechanically open and closed, inches from the girl's flesh. I swung all my weight against his neck causing him to topple backwards through the open door of our apartment. We tumbled as a group, crashing into his PC desk. He dropped the girl as he fell. I yelled at her to run. But she just sat there, paralyzed with fear. I hit Tao on the head with a heavy ceramic plant pot. It did not faze him. He tossed me aside, and I crashed into the wall next to his computer. He pounced on the girl, like some great possessed ape. Tears streamed her face. There was no chance of her escape. And that's when I did it. I brought the sword down on his neck. The replica sword had no sharpened edge. But the sheer weight of it against flesh was enough to nearly decapitate Tao. His broken spinal cord caused his body to fall limp on top of the girl, his head half attached. His mouth continued to snap open and closed until I swung the second blow, severing his head completely from his neck. I rolled his body away from the girl. She was unharmed, not even soiled. She ran off screaming and I closed the door behind her. And then I cried, alone and afraid. I cried for a long time and I waited thinking that soon the police would be here and my ordeal would be over. I was relieved in a sense, it would now be in their hands. If they locked me up then I couldn't hurt anyone else. But no one came and I couldn't keep myself awake, so I locked the apartment door from the inside and threw the key out the window. The next day I awoke to what looked like a burglary. My apartment was trashed, broken glass, upturned furniture and blood on the walls. It was no burglary though, it was me. The apartment door had been savagely clawed at and would probably not hold me for another night. My fingers were bloody and raw, but I felt no pain. I caught myself in the mirror to see I pulled out most of my hair. There was hair stuck between my teeth. I must have been eating it. And there, in the middle of the floor lay my beloved Tao. In a moment of fear and sadness, I tried to end it. I grabbed a shard of glass and cut myself. There was no pain and little blood, as if the blood inside me had all dried up. Clinging to the large shard of glass with my bare hands, I plunged it into my own stomach. I coughed a bit of tar-like blood, but otherwise there was no real consequence. I was trapped in this monstrous body until I wasted away. Out of fear for myself, and for the rest of humanity, I chained my neck with a bike lock to a sturdy radiator. I'm sure if I break free that the apartment door won't hold for long. I've since come to regret this decision. I'm not sure how many days it's been, but Tao's decaying body is now covered with small mushrooms. 
When they finally do find us, the infection will likely spread. I wish I had burned this place down. But instead I am stuck here with my phone and my boyfriend's decaying corpse. Stay safe.